In medicine, doctors only provide advice and the risk versus benefit of different treatment options. It's important that the patient or responsible parent has enough information that they are able to, to make an informed consent for themselves or their child. They also need sufficient time and information to process their thinking and opportunity to question the doctor. As such, it is a collaborative process with a sharing of information to enable the decision making in the best interest of the child. That is the basis of any therapeutic relationship with a doctor or clinician. A carer will now talk about her experiences as she helped her loved one go through the prescribing process. My name is Maria and my son Grant is a 40 year old and lives in a group home with three other residents of a similar age. Grant was diagnosed at an early age with severe intellectual disability and autism. As a child he was very hyperactive, quite destructive and chewed and mouthed absolutely everything. His sleeping patterns were very erratic and he only slept for short periods of time, usually three or four hours and mostly late at night. He is non-verbal and doesn't use Compic either. Grant has of course changed over the years. He has matured and he is not as fast as he used to be, which is a really good thing. He has reasonably receptive language if you keep it simple when you're talking to him. And he has a good sense of humour. Grant enjoys going out, especially for long walks in the park or the bush. It's very important for Grant to have a predictable routine and to trust and have confidence in the people who are looking after him or managing him. Grant is often loud and he can become quite agitated when he's unable to express his needs. He has a repertoire of rit ritualistic behaviours which he uses to show his distress and also to calm himself. In his early 20s and around Christmas time, Grant became louder than usual and displayed ex extreme ritualistic agitated behaviour. He wasn't able to be redirected and managed in the usual way and this episode lasted about two weeks and there was discussion amongst the staff about whether it was caused by the excitement of Christmas, too much sugar or a relief staff who he wasn't sure of. But gradually he calmed down and I was told later, but nothing was resolved and we assumed that it was a one-off event. I asked them to document the behaviours just in case they reoccurred. The following year was much the same. There was always ups and downs in his behaviour but generally he was manageable and then just before Christmas the same circumstances occurred. His behaviour escalated and he became loud and obsessive. I was very distressed by his distress and the varying reports of the staff. Some were blaming each other and their ability to manage him of course. This time the changed behaviour and the distress lasted about three or four weeks. I asked each of the staff to tell me what they believed may have been the problem so I could address each of the issues individually. I had his teeth checked in case it was a dental problem. I had the behaviour management plan reviewed. Heat was something also that distressed him. It was a real factor and so we had part of the house air conditioned. I then had a complete review done of his overall health and the well-being by a specialist at the Developmental Disability Health Unit. The doctor conducted a very comprehensive review and actually alerted me to the possibility that Grant could have a mental illness and that this could be the cause of those distressing symptoms and the pattern of those symptoms. Christmas and January of the following year were just awful. Grant's appearance and his demeanour left me in absolutely no doubt. His eyes were manic and frightening, even I was frightened of him, and he was completely out of control. And for the first time in his life, he was actually dangerous. We had to remove him from the house for the safety of others 
and set about finding a psychiatrist during a holiday period, which wasn't easy. We were in crisis and found a psychiatrist willing to see us at short notice. He prescribed Largactyl in the short term. I was too upset by all that had happened and was only concentrating on finding something, something that would make him manageable. Not much else was said or explained to me during the visit. The medication did help and it gave us time to decide what else was needed to be done. I was given the name of another psychiatrist, a very experienced man in treating people with disabilities and mental health problems. I took Grant to the psychiatrist and gave him the history that we had documented. The psychiatrist diagnosed bipolar affective disorder and advised that he would prescribe lithium. This seemed to be the only option. I was shattered to add bipolar to all his problems. He now had another label. What did this mean long term? I asked questions about how long would he need to take this drug and the psychiatrist explained that given the history, Grant would need to take this medication long term. I asked why this medication when there were newer ones available. The psychiatrist explained that this medication had a long known history and therefore more predictable. But if he does not get desired result from this medication, there are others that we can try. I think I was a bit shell-shocked by the enormity of this diagnosis. Mental illness had such negative connotations. I was concerned about side effects and I'm not really sure whether they were explained to me or not, but my mind was not willing to absorb any more information. The difficulty is always whether there are alternatives and as far as I was told, or can recall, recall, there were none. Grant was out of control and his living arrangements were now under threat. There was pressure to do something and to accept the professional advice that this medication was the best thing for him. I then did a lot of research myself and spoke to many people, people who had experience with these problems and I came to accept that this medication was needed for Grant to maintain a good quality of life. The psychiatrist saw Grant every three months for the next few years and now sees him six monthly. The medication has been remarkably successful. It allows Grant to continue to live in the group home and share the environment safely with his housemates and have a good quality of life. Grant has had very few side effects from the lithium. However, he did experience weight gain and excessive drinking, and both of these side effects have created difficulties. The drinking became a problem as he steals drinks and hurriedly gulps them, which has led to life-threatening aspiration pneumonia on several occasions. This problem has now been somewhat resolved by providing Grant a sippy cup and thickened fluids. The staff also monitor Grant's drinking with much greater vigilance. There are some things that I don't think were managed very well. The staff working in group homes and day programs are generally not trained in the management of people with mental illness issues. Grant has had a range of behaviours nearly all his life. They come and they go and they vary in their intensity. But all of a sudden, after the diagnosis, staff became really fearful and afraid of him, particularly those that don't know him very well. They perceived any change as, oh dear, is he having an episode? And made statements like, oh, he's going high and he's escalating. Should we ring the doctor? Grant picks up on all this negativity and it's really not good because all his behaviours emerge. It took quite a long time for the staff in the group home and the day program to calm down and to realise that Grant was the same person. Yes, he now had an added diagnosis, but on the whole he was well managed with the medication and he was well monitored by the psychiatrist and his local GP. Another issue was that Grant's behaviour plan did not identify the bipolar escalating symptoms, how they should be handled or what steps to take. The plan needed to identify the difference between the behaviours that have always been part of his repertoire, 
changes to look out for, and what to do if the symptoms and behaviours escalate dramatically. If I could give doctors any other advice, I would say it's very important to insist on staff keeping appropriate data so that the doctor or psychiatrist can get an overall picture of what is happening at appointments and not rely on information from one staff member who may or may not be aware of all the facts. The person going to the appointment with the patient should have knowledge of that person and be able to give an accurate account of what is happening in their life. If there is a family involvement, they should also be consulted as they have the continuity with that person and the knowledge of the history and the family background and may be the person responsible and therefore able to give a valid consent to any major medications. Information about reactions to medications and allergies is also important and can save a great deal of distress and anxiety. Information should be given to the family, the staff at the group homes and the day program. Even if a person with intellectual disability is non-verbal, they need to be communicated with in an age-appropriate way and have things explained to them in a way that they can understand. If you are unsure, ask the person, the person who's coming with them and knows them well, how they prefer to be communicated with. For example, my son can react very badly if people are saying negative things about him and an outburst can be avoided if care is taken to speak to him directly. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this podcast and I hope it's been of some help to you. Bye for now.